Galatians chapter number 5, beginning in verse number 16, Paul is writing to the church, churches there in Galatia. He says, this I say then, walk in the spirit that ye should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Man, it's like watching the news. Of the which I tell, tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. I want to preach on this thought today. What is in your garden. What is in your garden? And I'd propose to you tonight, this morning, that your heart is much like a garden. And whatever you plant there, and whatever you nourish there, will grow. What is in your garden? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for just some clear scripture on clean living. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be mindful of which list we want to live in, the kind of life that we want to have, the consequences of a life that we choose. Lord, we love you. I pray that you'd speak to hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen, you could be seated. Things definitely grow in your heart. Love grows in your heart. Bitterness can grow in your heart. Hatred grows in your heart. Wisdom grows in your heart. Things grow there. And, and you just have to learn uh, how to nurture things there. It says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh in multiple, it just gives you a long list of all these terrible things, revelings and murders and hatred and, and just every bad thing in life. And that happens when we cater to our flesh. You say, I don't really know what that means to cater to our flesh. It means doing what you want. Have, getting your way. Have you ever seen a kid that's just real rotten, spoiled? And you realize real quick that that kid, something's not growing right inside them. And because they're spoiled, their parents won't spank them. Their parents won't correct them. Their parents make excuses for them instead of, instead of, of properly guiding their children. The Bible says train up a child. And it's talking about train up a child in the way he should go. And listen, when he's old, he's not going to depart from it. But to train things is, is often difficult and kind of uncomfortable. And we're talking about gardens. Have you ever seen uh, like a, uh, somebody trying to grow a tree? And what do they do? They stake off that tree and, and it, it'll be bound. They'll, they'll tie it up. They'll tie it off to some stakes and, and pull that tree back. Why? Because that, that tree, if left to its own, is going to go the direction it wants to go. And if it ever tries to bear fruit, it's just going to fall. So you have to train it. Uh, if you want to have grapes and those things, you'll put up the, 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 the metal racks, uh, tomatoes and all those things. If you, just don't, if you don't want your fruit to be bad, you've got to train it so it'll climb up and do what it's supposed to do. So the fruit will be where it's supposed to be. Listen, your heart is like that. It's got to be trained. It's got to, it's got to be pulled the direction that it needs to go. Our children be that way. You pull them the way they need to go. Is it pleasant? No. 
And listen, I work all day. I work 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And whenever I get done with work, the last thing I want to do is go home and have to argue with kids. My favorite thing in the world is to walk in the front door and our youngest, he still thinks daddy's the coolest. The older kids are pretty convinced I'm not. But the youngest, he's like, daddy! And he drops what he's doing and I just have to brace for impact. Because he is coming in and just smack. And we just love on each other, man. When it gets close to bedtime, I, I, I want to go to bed earlier than most of the people in my house. So, man, the little guys come in and they're just like jumping on top of daddy. Daddy! Good night. And they, they want to hug. They want to cuddle for a minute. They want to pray. And I love that stuff. What I don't want to do is have to go home and spank a kid or go home and yell at kids that are fighting or go home and fuss at teenagers because they hadn't done what they were supposed to do. I hate that. But you know what? It's part of it. My kids don't like it. I don't like it. But left to their own, if my wife and I did not stay after our kids, they would turn out horrible. People are like, but you have the sweetest kids. Okay. Anything they are, I guarantee you, is, is a lot of work for my wife all day. There's been many a spanking, many a grounding. There's been weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's been privileges taken away. And listen, our, our kids, if you go comparing our kids, yeah, our kids are really good. But we expect our kids to grow up. Listen, I, I want some young men that are going to be well behaved. I want some good men of character that are going to grow up, get good jobs, be successful, get promoted. I want some good godly young men who love the Lord and will grow up. You know why? Because here's the thing. I want them to attract good godly women that they will marry. That then. They're, why? Because they're going to provide our grandchildren. I have seen grandparents go crazy over grandchildren. I can't wait to experience that. Our kids are young enough. We have a long time to wait. We're probably seven years out. I hope. But it takes work. It's, it's not always pleasant. My flesh says, just give them what they want so they'll be quiet. My flesh says, just ignore them and it'll go away. My flesh says, don't worry about it. I'll go to work tomorrow and she can deal with it. It's not pleasant. Meanwhile, she's going, if he would just hurry up and get home, if he's working late, I'm going to punish him too. You know? <laughs> and, you know, but raising children is hard. But let me tell you something. Raising that person in the mirror is just as hard. Training that person in the mirror to control your mouth, to control your attitude, to, to be loving, to be forgiving, to be patient, to be long-suffering, to do the list. You know, we come down here uh, to verse 22, to love. By the way, the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is, not are. Not the fruits are. The fruit is. It, it, it starts off with, with love. If you love the Lord, that'll give you some joy. By the way, if you love the Lord and you have joy, you'll find peace in your life. Hey, can I just tell you today, most of the people you know, most of the people I know have never made it to the peace part. They have a garden that is so dried out and ineffective, they've never made it to the peace part. I talk to people, you know, have over thousands of friends on Facebook, YouTube stalkers, church family people, people from camps, uh, people who meet at revivals, people at, um, at missions conferences we preach at, and they become your friends and you meet them. And what you realize as you're going through this life is that most people don't have peace. They have no peace in their life. A lot of them have no joy whatsoever in their life. And the problem is, is that they have a, a fascination with themselves and they never love the Lord and others. If you can ever love, learn to love the Lord and others, you'll get joy in your life. 
And if you have the joy of the Lord, I tell people all the time, I, it's kind of a catchphrase, but I just tell people, hey, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I'm feeling pretty strong today. And that gives me peace. And then as you go along, it says long-suffering. Long-suffering and patience are kind of in that same realm. But if you have peace in your life and you realize others don't, you, you kind of have a pity on them so you don't lash out at them. And sometimes it's just hard putting up with people, especially when most of their troubles are all self-inflicted wounds. But you, you have long-suffering, gentleness. If you learn to be long-suffering, you learn gentleness. Because you can wipe people out. I've heard people say, you know, somebody was really blunt. You know, I'm like, man, you were kind of hard on them. Well, they said they appreciated it. They said that so you'd shut up. Nobody appreciates being corrected. Nobody it really appreciates you fronting them out. And if you thought they did the first time, do it two more times. Watch how their reaction changes. You learn to be gentle with people. I've said things that were Bible right, but were people wrong. And I didn't say it with gentleness and it hurt people. I've had to learn to become a little more gracious, a little more gentle. And how I say that, it doesn't change the truth. And I don't candy coat it. I just don't walk up and bash them in the mouth with it. We'll stop and talk and say, well, tell me what's going on. Why do you think this happened? Here's what God's word said. So we're on a pathway. We're doing the wrong things, expecting a different result. So we need to change. Instead of walking up and going, hey, man, you're stupid. Let's, you know, just do this. It takes a minute. You learn gentleness. And then once you have gentleness, you have goodness. That's a long way to get, just to get some goodness. We're not worth much before that. Have you ever planted a garden and waited on stuff to grow? First time I ever saw that happen, we were in elementary school, and we planted a bean in a little cup. Do you know how long it takes? It must have been like eight years before something grew in that cup all in second grade. It took forever. I'm an impatient little child and I want, I want some beans. And finally, some little sprig of green poked up. And then it took forever. And then the teacher got jiggy with it and put a shoebox over it and put a bright light down on the end of the shoebox and all the little things turned and that was a lesson about light and all that. I'm not patient. But most people aren't patient. That's why it takes us so long to get to the goodness, to get to the good stuff. Have you ever tried to eat something that's not ripe yet? Get an apple that's not ripe, get an orange that's not ripe. You get a watermelon and it just wasn't ready yet. That watermelon, it needs to have like a yellow spot on the bottom where it's been sitting for a while. If it ain't got that on there, it ain't gonna be sweet. It'll be the right color. It'll be the right texture, but it's not going to be sweet. It sweetens up with patience, kind of like us. What's in your heart today? What direction are you headed? Goodness, faith. You go, wait a minute, I had faith before. Really? Remember the disciples when they're in the boat with Jesus? And the winds and the waves, the Bible says, are contrary. And Jesus is laying down in the boat. And what they do, they say, Master, cast thou not that we perish? And he stands up and he calms down the winds and the waves. The disciples turns to them and like, Oh, ye of little faith. Now these are people who were there. When Jesus talked to them about hard things, about forgiving, about forgiving people over and over again, when, as long as they ask for it. They said, Lord, increase our faith. And then that's when he talks about the mustard seed. He says, if you had had faith even as a mustard seed, if you just had this much faith, you could have you cast a sycamine tree into the ocean. He's telling them, you don't even have that much faith. Those are the people that had been there with Jesus when he cast out the devils, when he healed the blind, when he healed the sick, when he healed the deaf. 
They, one of them had walked on water with him. They had seen the miracles, watched him raise people from the dead. Jesus said, hey, you, if you had just had this much faith, you wouldn't be questioning me on, on a simple teaching like forgiveness. So I promise you, friend, it takes a long time to get to a place where you really have faith in God. That's why you talk to me, I'm like, well, I have faith in God. Oh, but I don't know what to do. I do. Have faith in God, period. Either we trust in the Lord or we don't. You know what our problem is? We go, this is our problem. Oh, here's our problem, Lord. I'm going to give it to you. And oh, and the way you need to handle this, Lord, this way we've been working it out. Do this, this, and that. You know what? I'll just take it with myself. I don't know why God's not doing anything in my life. Because you're not letting him do anything in your life. Hey, if you really want some good faith, you're going to have to let that percolate a while. It, it's deep in the fruit. I'm not talking about faith for salvation. I'm talking about faith for Christian living. Look at the rest. Meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. You're not going to have any problem. Nobody's going to be arguing with you about that. Nobody's going to make false accusations against you. You are too meek. You, sir, are too temperate in all things. You, sir, have too much faith. Are you kidding me? We don't get there. Why? Because we are over here gardening with the wrong stuff. The flesh. The flesh is at battle with our spirit. You're either going to do what you want to do or you're going to do what God wants you to do. So you're either going to submit to God's will or you're going to be in a spiritual tug of war against God. Here's the difference. There's a difference in being saved and being a Christian. Let me say that again. There is a difference between being saved and being a Christian. Being saved meant that you trusted on the Lord, you realize that you're lost, undone, bound for devil's hell. There's no other way to get to heaven. You can't earn it. There are no merits. There's nothing. It's impossible for you to be saved on your own. And you know that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. When you do that, you put your faith and trust in him for salvation. You're saved. Being a Christian means that your life and your actions identify with Christ. That you are an absolute, overt, and obvious follower of Christ. I know a lot of people, you go, how do you get to heaven? Oh, there's no way to get to heaven except for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and Christ alone, he, he died on the cross. His blood washed me white as snow. He died on the cross. But they're mean. They're ugly about stuff. They're lazy. They don't want to. Don't tell me you ain't going to work for a living and you're going to talk about you're a Christian. That's ungodly. You're not going to do what you're supposed to do. You're not going to raise your kids right. You're not going to be raised right. I'm going to be rebellious. There's no rebellion in Christianity. Look, look at verse 24. But they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If, look what it says, if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. See, you can live in the Spirit because when you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God seals you until the day of redemption and you're sealed. You're never going to lose your salvation. To say you can lose your salvation is an absolute heresy. Either you were never saved or you're saved forever. Sealed until the day of redemption. You go, well, I trusted Jesus and I got saved, but I did something real bad. So did Jesus. He went to the cross and died for you and shed his blood. Which one of your sins is more powerful than the blood of Jesus? Dare I say none. Now you ought to repent and get right no matter what you did. I don't care if you stole a pen from work or you robbed a bank. You need to repent and get things right. You need to make the choice. If you live in the spirit, if you're saved, let us also walk in the Spirit. There is a choice, and you have to make it. 
And I can tell you guys don't like that one little bit. Let's, let's try to help you. Let's go over where are we at. Galatians, go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians 3. I know you're struggling. I want to help you. Paul, wants to, Paul knew 2,000 years ago we'd need some help here. Ephesians chapter number 3. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Slide down to verse 14. Look what Paul's prayer was to the church. This is a called out group of believers set apart for God's purpose of fulfilling the great commission. These are saved people in church. Here's what he says, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So something's about to happen and you're going to need some strength. Let's see, let's see what you need to be strong uh, all about. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in him. Rooted and grounded. Boy, that sounds like a, a garden, doesn't it? He was just talking about your heart. Okay. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth, all, uh, passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So you, you're in Christ, but you don't have all the fullness of God yet. You need the inner strength. You need that inner man to be strengthened. You need to be rooted and grounded in him. You need to know the love of Jesus Christ that passeth knowledge so we can get that kind of strength that we can be filled with all the fullness of God now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. See, there's a power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That's some good stuff right there. And in case you didn't get it, in those two spots, let's go to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. In Colossians, chapter number 2. Right to the church at Colossae. Again, New Testament church, New Testament preacher, preaching a message. This could be Lighthouse Baptist, chapter 2. It's Colossians, chapter 2. Look at verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk ye in him. Look at it. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Guys, it's a process. As you then have been, you have life in Christ. If you've been planted in Jesus Christ by grace through faith in him, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God that, which brings eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you've been planted in Him, you're going to need strength in your innermost parts so that you can grow in Him, being rooted and built up in Him. You've got to get your roots in. You, you've got to be built up in Him. There's a growing process. That's why he says you desire the sincere milk of the word. That is a baby Christian. But then later you need hard meats. Hard meats. At the time when you should have been having T-bone steak, the Apostle Paul says that you're still desiring milk. When you should have been a teacher, you still need to be taught. There's a growing process. If you had a child and that child gets to be a year old and they're not pulling up and they're not crawling and they're not trying to walk, you would take that baby to the doctor and find out why your baby's not growing. If that baby got to be two and they're not walking, I'm telling you, your doctor would be prescribing all kinds of physical therapy, occupational therapies, we have a daycare and we've got a few kids that are behind. I mean, quick, fast, and in a hurry. Those kids are a couple of months behind the, behind the goal. And I mean, we have therapists coming in. They're working with them, working with them, working with them. 
We adopted a baby. We were told he would have white matter disease and he would be behind and he, he might be the kid in the wheelchair. And he would be the kid that would never function and he would never learn and he may never say, I love you. I'm telling you, man, we prayed over that baby and we prayed over that baby. We asked you to pray over that baby. We asked people around the world to pray about our baby. And, and my wife, she took him to the therapies, the speech therapy, the, 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 the occupational therapy, the physical therapy. And he got stronger and stronger and stronger. Finally, the lady said, hey, he's about to walk. He's ahead of the game. You don't hey, call us if you need us. But they weren't sure at first they had seen lesions on so they did another MRI they said it's inconclusive we need another MRI this baby's just a few months old MRIs finally they came back and they said the reason the first, second one was inconclusive is we couldn't find the lesions we wanted to make sure so we took him to the hospital on the same with the same that had read the first one and there were no lesions. We praise God for that. But you know what? We didn't know. So therapy and therapy and work and work and growing and growing and trying to get there. Why? Because you expect them to grow. I think God expects His children to grow. And sometimes you're going, I don't understand why things are hard in my life. God's trying to help you to grow. By the way, if things aren't growing in your garden, you know what you got to do? Throw a little fertilizer in there. You don't fertilize something. If you're like, goodness, gracious, alive, look at this. It's growing, it's producing, it's doing all that. You don't add any fertilizer. You just water it, man. You just water it and stay out of the way and reap the harvest. But when it's not growing, you're watering. But it may be time for some fertilizer. You say, I just don't know why I'm going through this in my life. Well, you better figure it out because you're getting some fertilizer for some reason. The fertilizer's on deck and fertilizer is exactly what you think it is. In the story where the man had the, had, had the garden and, and the owner of the garden came and he said, Look at this tree. I've been coming here for years. It's not producing anything. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And the keeper said, you know what? Let me, let me dig about it and dung it. Dig about it and dung it. Do you think that tree was sitting there going, you know what? I, could, I hope somebody comes and digs around my roots. That ought to be comfortable. You know what I'd like? I'd like some dung. I need more dung in my life. You think that, that would be dumb, wouldn't it? You know who I talk to all the time? <laughs> Preacher, I, I need to talk to you. I don't have nearly enough dung in my life, so I'm just doing all these things, bringing dung in. I'm like, hello. God's trying to help you. What's in your garden? What's in your garden today? I mean, you had the list. You had the list there in Galatians 5. Are you starting to grow in love and faith and joy? And I mean, are you growing in all these things? Or is it envy, strife, hatred? I mean, you don't have to say it out loud. Just be real honest with yourself. I know you're not going to be honest with me. That's embarrassing. But we can be honest with ourselves. Well, you came to the right place because you heard the right message from God's Word. We have a pretty good place. I, I tried it out the other day. Our new prayer benches, they work real good. I said, man, I hope other people pray there. I'm going to pray there. Miss Crystal was in here. We were getting them in place. I said, I'm going to pray. She got down there and prayed. I made sure I started praying before she did. I want to be first. We have a good place to pray. You can pray right at your seat. You know what's in, there, in your garden because you can observe what's growing there. By the way, you may not want to deal with it, but other people can see what's growing there as well. And even if you figured out how to hide your garden, maybe you got a high fence up, nobody can see what's in your garden. God has a really good view. And God knows what's growing in our garden. Father in heaven, we love you. 
We thank you for being good to us. And Lord, as you look at our garden, you know. You know absolutely what's there. Lord, if somebody's here today and they're not saved, they need to put their faith and trust in Jesus. That's understandable. That's wonderful. We'd love to show them in the scriptures how to be saved. But Father, for those that are saved, we know, we see clearly in the scriptures that our life should show it or else something's wrong. There may be other needs, there may be other problems going on and some folks just need to come and pray. Lord, I just pray that you'd have your perfect way and will in our lives. We just desire, we desire for you to be glorified in our lives. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name with thanksgiving.